to One. Media Mothership here on Edge Radio 99.3. We're broadcasting out of Edge Radio Studios in Hobart, Tasmania, and streaming as well on YouTube and Twitch if you search under the Media Mothership channel. Uh, we explore how the media shapes our understanding of the world around us and everything in and around the world of media and popular culture. I'm your host, Dr. Craig Norris, PhD. Joined by B.A. Zeke. Yo, what up? <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm in the station. <laughs> you are in the station, B.A. Zeke. Yeah. Uh, today's show, we're going to be looking at uh, minute 5 to 10 of House on Hoarded Hill 1959. Yep. <laughs> and we're going to uh, explore there the escalating... Five Stages of Fear through this film. Then we're going to have a little look at uh, maybe some news that's hitting the airwaves. So there's uh, interesting discussion around the FIFA 23 video game featuring a, a new fantasy, I put in quote marks, uh, football manager and team. Uh, also, Australian business owners being urged to shorten web addresses to avoid cybercrime. If we have time for it, also talking about Tom Hardy taking home the gold in a martial arts competition. You know, fact meets fiction. Mm. Uh, finally, we'll be wrapping up the hour with our special guest, uh, Eildul Dering. <laughs> I, I, do know, I do know her name. I, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, so I'm not even going to try. Eildul. Uh, and uh, we'll be looking at uh, her new book, Two Bodies, Three Fools, that's just come out and getting the lowdown on how to, you know, kind of self-publish and put material together to then circulate over all these exciting uh, book spaces. Mm, that'd be really cool. Yes, yes, hopefully, hopefully it will be. Uh, let's, however, set the scene uh, as I'm just scrolling through to find what I want to talk about in today's show. So just to set it up, um, we'll dive into the first five, uh, the next five minutes of House on Haunted Hill. I want to set it up by playing a short segment of the scene we're looking at. And this is as the characters have arrived in the House on Haunted Hill. And of course, as we talked about last week, the reason we're doing this is to break down the use of particular camera angles and the five stages of fear. Do you remember the five stages of fear? Uh, yeah, I believe it's... I can't remember which one comes first, but horror terror, repulsion, uh, recovery, and background. Yeah. So basically it's a, it's a kind of um, de-escalating scale. So, well, actually, no, <laughs> the number of, yeah, terror is the kind of anticipation of mm. something about to happen. Horror is the experience of that thing which happens. Repulsion is another experience of a particularly, you know, body horror type moment. And then we have recovery, which is a period of relative safety after the experience of horror or repulsion. And then finally, background, which is uh, where no terror, no fear should exist and mm. is more exposition. So we're going to set this up and talk a little bit about how we're unpacking the film. So here we are. The five characters have come together. The, the basic of Haunt, House on Haunted Hill is um, Vincent Price plays the wealthy owner of mm -hmm. this mansion and he's invited these characters in to, to kind of play a game with them. And, and here we'll hear a little bit about the game. I'm afraid I don't even know your name. I'm Nora Manning. Lance Schroeder. Is Frederick Lauren a friend of yours? I've heard of him, but I've never met him. I work for one of his companies, but I've never seen him. I've never met the man either. Just a phone call. Do you know him? <laughs> no. Well, then you're the only one of us who does. I don't know him. All the details about running the house were done by mail. He's quite wealthy, isn't he? Millions. And uh, five wives, I believe. Four, I think, so far. A $50,000 party for only five people is a little steep, even for a millionaire. <laughs> well, if I were going to haunt anybody, this would certainly be the house I'd do it in. All right, I just want to pause it there. All right, so we have this, this you know... Uh, an interesting moment. This is all just background, so no fear there. I don't know. Do you were you experiencing any fear? No, no fear there. Yes, yeah, so no fear. They're just all meeting. They're talking about why are they there? A bit of anticipation, 
And then he, one of the characters sets up this idea of, if I was going to scare anyone, this is the house I'd do it in, right? Mm-hmm. So the idea that this is, you know, classic kind of, um, you know, anticipation moment, right? You, you say something and it, it's a setup, right? So, so um, what comes next is, 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 a, is a, what I'm labeling the first terror moment in the film at 7 minutes 32 seconds in, if you've been playing at home. I wonder if you also experienced a slight acceleration of the heartbeat. So 7.32. So there's some sound effects which occur now. So he's just said, I wonder, you know, if this if was on a scale, so one, this is the house I do it in. And again, it's this kind of Gothic mansion. So then he sets up what comes next. Pay particular attention in an audio sense for the type of sound effects that are happening, right? In, in, if you were doing what's called the Foley, fo- Foley, Foley, mm. Um, repertoire, that's the Foley is the shorthand for creating sound to sound really convincingly for something else. So like the sound of um, punching a cabbage sounds really close to, to a punch on the head maybe, right? Yeah. Or, or kind of rattling sand in a bucket is like rain, something like that. Yeah. Anyway, so there's some sound effects coming up. See if you can detect the escalating terror which is about to unfold. Close the door. This thing's made of solid steel. All right, yeah, I like that because we've got the background music happening, right? That kind of violin mm. and that, that kind of piano sting, that kind of bloop, bloop. Yep. So we can tell, you know, that they're, they're kind of foreshadowing here. So we've had two foreshadows, one in dialogue of him saying, you know, if, if I was going to scare anyone, this is the house I do it in. And then we hear this kind of, um, you know, the classic cliched, ominous music about to to kind of play out. Uh, the, the tinkling sound is the chandelier that we're constantly getting these low shots mm. up into. Uh, and it's a super expensive chandelier. Uh, and, of course, you know, the repeated low shots of the guests possibly looking up at it or at least drawing the audience's eyes to the chandelier is this idea of the mise-en-scene of the film signaling to the audience member that, that this, is, this is we're entering terror. Mm. Right? I'm thinking we've got spooky music. Uh, we've got that kind of... It's not the psycho kind of piano sting, but yeah. it's definitely a kind of weird, jarring piano sting. And the characters kind of rush around and say, you know, this, this, this door can't open after it banged shut by no apparent reason. And then this, these, these shots. So let's see here what happens next here to the chandelier. How did you feel just then? Uh, completely fine. I think <laughs> watching it, I had to remember that when I was uh, associating which stage of fear it was, I had to remember that it's what they intended rather than what I felt. Because I watched it and yeah. I was like, yeah, I mean, it happened. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess that's right. Because one of the things we're coding here is how the characters are reacting to mm. that thing. So uh, what's interesting here is that we have the characters reacting to that moment of seeing the chandelier suddenly fall by... Um, uh, so, yeah, the chandelier kind of fall. It kind of misses the characters, but the, one of the characters kind of grabs the other one to rescue them. And we have this kind of reaction shot of them looking in. What I'm going to say is potentially the first moment of horror. Yeah. It's the actual experience of threat to oneself yeah right so while they don't know what the chandelier was nevertheless somehow for some reason it broke and then we have this wonderful shot low shot looking up at vincent price right the other like this is just for the audience Mm. um we can presume that vincent price is up on the second floor looking down over this railing upon the guests and he looks kind of like a, a, a little bemused Mm. Right, so setting up this idea of of his voyeurism of them, and uh, possibly the the antagonist, right, the person putting ba- barriers and boundaries in in place of of the characters. Yeah, and it's also interesting that um, 
from that scene, and then I believe there's another one where it looks down from his perspective, basically, onto them sort of looking at the chandelier. It kind of... There's been multiple sort of high shots in this uh, yes. throughout the other scenes that we've we've done, well, for the, the past five minutes that we've done, and in this scene leading up to this point. And it kind of trend... Like, it kind of associates that those high shots with him. So that's kind of... And whenever you see here, as you'll see coming up, uh, or as you'll hear, and then we'll talk about... Um, there's whenever he's on screen it's kind of it's either medium or there's sort of like you're looking up at him yeah every time so it's almost positioned like he is higher than everybody else yep yeah yeah so again this 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 kind of ominous i think terror marker that, that this is in this case it's not the characters reacting to this shot because the characters don't see him surprised but nevertheless as an audience member it's meant to be ratcheting up this kind of, ooh, what's the spooky Vincent Price character about mm. to do? Uh, so what, what we'll do now is interestingly play uh, a little bit of the scene which follows, which I really enjoy because the comments underneath this kind of praise the dialogue between these two characters, Vincent Price and his wife, and about how deliciously um, um, antagonistic they are with each other. Mm. Uh, and there's a scene here which I do want to unpack in a second after we watch it. So here they are. So it's just basically them. He walks into the bedroom. He meets his wife, and they talk about their plans. Yeah. All right, with these guests. Guests are here and fortunately still alive. Is your face on yet? Dust and dirt everywhere, and the water barely trickles. Couldn't you have had the place clean? Atmosphere, darling. You know how ghosts are. They never tidy up. Well, that's a very fetching outfit, but hardly suitable for a party. I'm not going to the party. Mm, the spend the night ghost party was your idea, remember? Since it's going to cost me $50,000, I want you to have fun. The party was my idea until you invited all the guests. Why all these strangers? Why none of our friends? Friends? Do we have any friends? No, your jealousy took care of that. I had a reason for inviting each guest. I wanted kind of a cross-section. From psychiatrist to typist, and from drunk to jet pilot. They share one thing, they all need money. Sorry, Zeke, just, just putting on the spot with a <laughs> sudden cut there. Uh, we'll wrap it there. I mean, so what we're having there is this kind of, you know, moment where Vincent Price is describing uh, the, you know, I, I think it's a recovery moment in terms of a bit of horror has happened. The characters, two of the characters have experienced a near death, possibly, yeah. in the chandelier. And then we're having this recover moment, which is relatively safe, but Vincent Price is building up this sense of suspense. Now, I don't remember... Do you remember anything about the scene there with the champagne? Um, no, not particularly. On multiple viewings, it stood out to me that champagne is really central to that scene. So what happens is Vincent Price goes over to the, um, the bottle of champagne. And he starts shaking it up, right? Mm. And the wife has this moment of kind of fear as she's saying, you know, why, why are you doing that? Why do you always shake the champagne up? And then Vincent Price says it's so it won't explode. Mm. And I've never c come across this, this idea that you shake champagne so it doesn't explode. Have you ever heard that? No. Because I thought if you shook it, it would make it worse. It yeah, would that's what, yeah, that's what I'd assume, but I don't. Yeah, I'm not too sure. So I, I did a bit of research because <laughs> I thought, you know, one of the things we celebrate in Media Mothership is uh, the deep entry point into knowledge that can come about through the most unlikely of spaces in popular culture. So I did some research. And, and, and indeed, on Reddit, there's an actual question which asks, why does Vincent Price shake up the champagne in House on Haunted Hill so it won't explode? Doesn't champagne make it explode yeah 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 so it's actually a central question so this this question which has 18 likes 
<laughs> and was posted 11 <laughs> months ago. So recently, oh, that's pretty, yeah, pretty recent. the answer goes for like five par- four or five paragraphs and is a deep dive into chemistry. Oh, okay. Yeah. And basically the, the reason this uh, uh, the person that replied to the Reddit post, there were like five or six replies, but the one they are most upvoted at 29 upvotes, said it's, it's, um, it has nothing to do with, with changing the pressure that's in the champagne bottle. Shaking it or hitting it on the top mm. will uh, affect the distribution of the gas that's at the top of the bottle into the liquid. So it mm. helps the absorption of bubbles into the liquid, which then I went into a deeper dive about. And, and it turns out that, um, oh, I forgot what the language is. There's, there's a, with, with wine, with corks, there's, there's a possibility of, of imperfections which means some gas can be in those kind of nooks and crannies in a cork mm. that can uh, uh, cause problems. And so by shaking it or hitting it, you kind of shift that gas away from that. But it can also inhabit those nooks and crannies. I was looking at the answer and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't get any statement as to whether it's a good or a bad thing. I mean, shaking it, the, the, the problem with shaking it is that it will create that gas to be absorbed in the liquid and that then has to go somewhere which creates foam, right? So mm. that you get you get a lot of bubbles mm. if you shake something, so like a Coke bottle or something. So if you shake it, what happens is you don't create pressure, you create uh, foam, right? Mm. You create water with bubbles. Well, you create a lot of bubbles, basically, which is foam. And so then, yes, when you open it, it wants to equilibrialize wants to meet, get into yeah. a state of equilibrium. Yeah. And and to do that, the bubbles, uh, which are, uh, of course, now towards the uh, the neck of the bottle, race out. So that's why, you know, if you do shake something, you open it, you can just have a lot of foam spraying yeah. out everywhere. It's not that there's pressure that's built up. It's, it's There's no more or less pressure from shaking it. But what there is more of is bubbles. Bubbles. Because you've moved that gas into the liquid. Mm absorbed into the liquid and all those bubbles then want to escape to reach equilibrium right mm. a neutral state i am just amazed at the science you know i had none of these words before an hour ago <laughs> <laughs> when i started researching this all thanks but again you know it doesn't explain to me why he said it was to stop exploding right but again looking into it there's there's something about Mm. There's something about I did read something about yeah yeah these nooks and crannies in imperfect corks where where they can get trapped yeah I guess I I wondered whether it was um, he meant the literal bottle or whether he meant the cork because obviously the cork on a usually explodes off so but he's shaking whether... it to stop it exploding yeah Which exactly is a weird thing yeah. yeah so look um text in now on our sms do you got the number the sms number it's uh, I can get it or or feel free to to post a chat message on the on SMS line zero four eight 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 one one seven zero seven. Yeah. Do you shake your champagne bottles to stop them exploding? <laughs> I mean, it's getting warmer, so it's worth asking. I know that temperature true. does also make a difference to preventing explosions with champagne. Yeah. Um, you want them at not uh, like not a warm temperature, from what I've. Again, that was just from an hour ago. Looking at yeah. It's a really deep dive. So that <laughs> was incredible for me, that moment of five minutes, because it was an interesting moment where, where the wife, because then he held the champagne bottle like a gun towards her, and mm. he said, um, wouldn't that be a great story if um, billionaire playboy kills wife from exploding yeah, champagne cork? cork. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I really needed to resolve that to get a good night's sleep tonight. (laughs) So (laughs) I think I've done a good public job there, public service for everyone who's been watching along at home the next five minutes. So basically, where are we at with the five minutes there of Hansel's Fond of Deal? What's your pulse like? Um, I actually really enjoyed that that last five minutes. Yeah. I think it's really getting into it quite fast. The first couple of minutes, like, they were good, obviously, but they were just a lot of, like, the setup and setting everything up, here's the premise and all that kind of stuff. A lot of the, I really like Vincent Price. I haven't seen a lot of his acting, but I can see why he must have been a very good actor. Yeah, yes. delicious. This seems like a delicious role for him. Yeah, right? I did really enjoy Yeah, the, the interaction between him and his wife were, was very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's seeming a little um, villainous. Yeah. 
Alrighty. All right. Well, uh, let's go to a Vox Pop, and we'll come back with a very, very special guest. Excellent. Very special guest, Rex. <laughs> <laughs> His name. You know, I, I, I'm going to make a, a better go at your name. Ely. Eily. 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 You did it. Yeah. All right. So we're going to come back from Eily about, what, five minutes? Uh, yeah, five minutes, 30 seconds. All right. Thank you. All right. It's a great pleasure to be in front of such an immensely impressive cosplayer with fantastic <laughs> boots. Um, if you can tell me your name and the cosplay first. Yep, so my name is Moss. I am cosplaying Mikan from Danganronpa. Mikan from Dra- Danganronpa. Danganronpa. Yeah. <laughs> is that a manga, anime, video game? Um, it's a video game. It's a visual novel. And um, the thing that has struck me most about the cosplay is those incredible boots. Can you tell me a bit about how those boots work? Um, so they are platforms, so they're not as hard to walk in as I thought it, they would be. They're actually pretty okay to walk in. Don't really hurt or anything. They're pretty cushiony as well, yeah. Because <laughs> it looks like that platform comes up, oh, maybe 10 or 20 centimetres? About that, yeah. I'm not sure what it is in inches. I'm not sure about the height at all. But um, no, they're not too bad to walk in, though. And then there's, what, maybe 15 little clasp straps on it? Yeah. It is a bit much, though. They do kind of rub together, which is... It's fine, but it's all right. <laughs> yeah, because for the unwary, I guess, you'll pick up a costume and then you'll road test it. So road testing this costume, it's gone pretty smoothly so far? Yeah. Oh, it's gone smoothly. My wig sort of half fell off, so I had to fix that. That's That's fine. <laughs> I think there's always got to be a bit of a wardrobe malfunction. You've got to live on the edge yeah, to see. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I've asked this question of everyone. What's the first pop culture that comes to your head right now? Um, well, looking around at everyone, definitely anime. But it mainly seems anime. What other pop cultures have you seen today? I've seen probably everything under the sun, to be honest. I've seen so many different things and everyone looks so amazing. Anything that surprised you? Um, not necessarily. I was surprised by some of the cosplays, though. Like, the effort that goes into that. It's, it's incredible. <laughs> uh, talking of looking adorable, you look fantastic. If you could give me your name and your cosplay. Okay, hi. My name is Stacey Highland, and I'm cosplaying as Junko Inoshima from Danganronpa. So, we're, like, uh, partner characters. So, what's the narrative? Are you guys best friends? Are you villains together? Um, so, Junko's, like, the head kind of mastermind of the evil plot to, like hurt a bunch of people and she kind of brainwashes Mikan so Mikan's like her little little servant type thing I don't know what's your take on that no no that's pretty accurate that's that's, 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 pretty, that's, pretty, that's pretty spot on so do you guys uh, go to school together uh, work together um yeah work together at McDonald's all right yeah ground zero for Tassie pop culture what is Tassie pop culture that's another thing I've been asking with your position in McDonald's you see a lot of characters people real people fictional people come by what do you think tazzy pop culture is is there something about tazzy at the moment apart from black puffer jackets that are pop culture oh honestly um oodies oodies yeah oodies yeah what do you do you agree yeah i would say oodies you get a lot of people with just oodies on yep so has there been anything that surprised you today at the um festival here um i'm surprised thankfully by how many people there were because i i guess when the first event I saw was Taz Pop North last year, which was a bit smaller because of COVID. And so when I got here and they were like, there's too many people. I was like, wow. So that's really good to see. So uh, are you locally Hobart based or have you come down from Ta- uh, Launceston? We're both from Launceston. Yeah. So uh, any bigger plans here in Hobart while you're here? Um, no, it's pretty much just Taz Pop. Yeah. Taz Pop at the, the market, but that's... Yeah. I felt like that was bound to happen eventually, but... It's right there. Yeah, we especially went through the market during the cosplay parade, and all of the shoppers were having a bit of a look at us. What was their reaction to seeing cosplayers come through? Um, There's a lot of random people taking photos, so at yeah. first I was like, oh, all right. <laughs> it sort of grew on me a little. I was like, I kind of like the attention. It's kind of, it's kind of all right. <laughs> Because have you ever been able to wear cosplay out in public like this before? No, this is the first time I've done it. Right. I've worn it before, but not in Tassie. Yeah, so in WA, but not in Tasmania before. So it's interesting to kind of gauge the level of cosplay acceptance in Tasmania, which is pretty cool. Yeah, everything's been nice, warm and accepting here so far. And the gender breakdown's been really... A lot of 
a fantastic girl power, I think. A lot of, you know, if I think about the number of people cosplaying and the demographic breakdown, I think it represents a kind of creative girl power. Guys going, is that just my weird mind to you? or no, that makes sense. I think so. Yeah. And it's also, I've noticed, it seems to be a safe environment for, like, people of different gender expressions or, like, abilities. So I've seen people that, say, have pins which are, like, representing their ability and any of their special needs and I think that's good that we have a space where people feel that they can express any needs and they can be met. <laughs> that is excellent. If I could have asked for a better encapsulation of today's festival, I think you've nailed it on the head. So <laughs> thanks very much for being involved. Uh, any final thoughts? It's a bit cold. <laughs> it's a bit cold. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Hey, you're listening to Media Mothership here, broadcasting out of Edge Radio Studios in Tasmania. I think that's still, that's okay. There you go. It started again for some reason. It did. Well, you know, they just wanted to hear it again because that was a short vox pop from the Taz Pop back a few years ago, uh, <laughs> weeks ago, where I was interviewing two cosplayers who were dressed in fantastic uh, uh, kind of. I remember their boots, huge boots, and uh, as they were saying, one. Oh visual. yes, I think wasn't one of them dressed as Alice in Wonderland or something. But well, like that, a that with was like your intertextual... sort of a gothic yeah it was, version or something. Yeah, they were a visual novel, mm. and it was yeah a kind of weird dynamic between the two. Anyway, that was that. Right now, it's a real pleasure to have uh, Eily on the show talking about her new book uh two bodies three falls and definitely i'll read i'll read the blurb for your book to set it up because it's such a wonderful blurb it's certainly in my wheelhouse in terms of um the kind of uh, paranormal genre mixing up that we have so the, the blurb is um i'll use the abbreviation 2b3f is that the abbreviation? is that what's going by by the cool kids yeah yeah one day when i'm famous it'll be its own hashtag <laughs> We'll put that in our Instagram. So it's a paranormal romantic comedy about a vengeful poltergeist named Marianne. Yeah. Uh, who falls in love with a very average University of Tasmania student. I wonder if that student was um, lectured by a really cool <laughs> lecturer called Craig Norris. Maybe in the expanded fine fiction I'll be doing. Anyway, so you test student <laughs> named Xander and steals another student's body in order to pursue him romantically. Uh, but it doesn't work out too well, uh, and we end up with a love triangle of three folks in two bodies. Uh, and Marianne is being chased by the ghost mafia. Well, that's a lot of world building there. Uh, and everybody gets quite upset. All right, so um, how long has this been percolating in your mind to, to, to release into the world? Oh, I came up with the idea initially when I was about 17, in year 12. This was 2014, I think. Yep. Um, I, I like to try and write books in new genres that I haven't done before. So I'd written several books before this one. And I thought one day, oh, I've never written a paranormal romance because I don't really like reading paranormal romances very much. So I thought, what if I wrote one that I actually did like? Right. And so I thought, well, what can I do to make this genre different? Or what can I do to write a book in this genre that I would like? And I thought of three things. One, I would set it uh, at a university rather than a high school, because then you can write characters who are a little bit more emotionally mature than teenagers, hopefully, and have a bit more autonomy and can do more things but are still, like, young and fun and a bit, you know, um, outrageous and will do silly things as well. And then I thought, what if I make it a comedy? Because a lot of, in fact, every paranormal romance that I've ever heard of has been, like, very serious and very angsty, um, and I don't write a lot of serious, angsty stuff. So I thought, what if I make it a romantic comedy? And then I thought, what if, instead of using, like, vampires or werewolves, I use a ghost, maybe even a poltergeist who's got, like, powers to move stuff around and cause mayhem so the fleshing out of characters sounds like it's really grounded in everyday experience um mm. and uh um i imagine because it's a utah student there are local references throughout <laughs> to hobart or? yeah oh, look it's not explicitly set at utah like it's never utah is never mentioned in the book but if you read between the lines you can sort of put two and two together i didn't want to make it 
actually explicitly you, Taz, just in case, you know, some of my old lecturers started to think, oh, I wonder if that's me being referred to in this scene. But it is me. We all know that. Oh, <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> um, but I thought uh, I'll, I'll make it like a fictional version of you, Taz, and I won't say what university it is, but you can kind of gather from the fact that there's only one university in this city then um, it's probably you, Taz. Well, one of the things Zeke and I are going to embark on is uh, media pilgrimages around Tasmania oh. that have been mapped out by popular culture text. So we're really hoping we can use Two Bodies, Three Fools as a uh, map of some moments. So Zeke and I can. plan to reenact some of the scenes really? uh, in some of the locations. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. Yeah. I'll draw up an itinerary for you. Thank later. you. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you have a map by any chance of locations they go to or? Um, no, because again, I didn't want to make it to, like I didn't want to name a suburb and go, oh, that's their suburb and have readers uh, making media pilgrimages to that suburb. But there's, there's a couple of locations that are explicitly mentioned and other ones I can invent for you. Well, that's what fans are for. Yeah. <laughs> Eileen, I, I think in terms of that, that's the energy we can bring to it. We're going to do a little fan Google map <laughs> with photos of us on there and just a little side project we've got. So it's so exciting to have material particularly set locally. Mm. Um, in terms of being able to develop this book further from an idea back in grade 12 to now... Um, what what are some of the big steps you've had to move along? Like, um, how did you end up self-publishing through a number of spaces at the moment? I notice this is on uh, Kindle. It's available through Book Depository and a couple other spaces. How did you yeah, create that that's distribution? That's a great question. Um, oh, that's got a really big answer. Um, I finished the first, not the first draft, but like the first version of this book like edited and I thought it was finished at the time around when I had graduated uni I think actually I finished it in my third year of uni and I spent my fourth and final year um, editing it and getting it ready to publish and at that point I was looking into traditional publishing still and sending it out to agents and things like that and not getting a lot of um, enthusiasm because it's a very very niche book and I think it's not going to sell millions of copies and that's what agents want and they probably also want something that's a bit less um genre maybe um so I started thinking about self-publishing when a couple of years later I heard about a concept called print on demand um what someone that I know at the time was using a print on demand company to create merchandise so they'd design a logo and then that logo could just be put on a website and then people could order like a mug and the mug would have the logo printed onto it and then it would be sent to their house and I thought oh I wonder if there's something like that for books because uh, initially the thing that turned me off the idea of self-publishing was oh what if I have to pay to print like you know, 100,000 copies of this book and then only 10 people want to buy it and I've just spent several grand for nothing. Um, but I thought, oh, if you could do it print on demand, then all you need is the file and then when pe as people order it, it can get printed and sent to them. So I did a quick Google search and it turned out there was an Australian company based in New South Wales called IndieMosh who specialise in doing exactly this. They get Australian authors mainly and they walk them through the self-publishing process they make sure you have a nice looking final product they you know design your cover for you and they format your pdfs for you and they send them off to another company called Ingram Spark which is the distributor and they're the ones with the printers and they're the ones with the distribution network so basically you go through Ingram and you are automatically then um, available on places like Amazon and Book Depository and pretty much everywhere else that you buy books online. Did you find many choices when you were looking at how you could start the ball rolling here or is there really only one or two choices? I think now that I've learned a bit more about the process from the inside, I can see more options available. Like, So, for example, if I were to do another book, which I definitely will, um, I could have the option of not using IndieMosh anymore and going straight through Ingram. Um, which would mean that I'd have a lot more responsibility for things like cover design and formatting the PDFs, but would also have more control over that process. I'd have an, I don't know if there's an alternative to Ingram in terms of distribution. I mean, you could go straight through Amazon, but to be honest, Amazon probably owns like all of the companies anyway. But you could also look into other print-on-demand providers or um, other e-book channels or things like that maybe. 
So it it did require a little bit more knowledge than just uploading a file onto Amazon yeah. and clicking a button. But nevertheless, were you surprised? Was it was it easier or more difficult than what you were expecting? It was pretty easy. Um, it, I think you're basically paying someone else to do all of that fiddly work for you. That's what IndieMosh does. Like you pay them an upfront fee, but then they take care of uh, making sure that your file meets certain specifications or they take care of the random little admin things you have to do, like getting an ISBN or getting a copyright license or whatever. Um, but again, once you've done that process once and you know a little bit more about what you need, then you can ask yourself, oh, well, would I rather spend the time and do that myself or would I rather pay, keep paying someone else to do it for me? Quality of life kind of Yeah, yeah, pretty that, much. Uh, and particularly, yeah, trying to chart this way uh, relatively outside of any uh, kind of supports, yeah, it can be handy bringing in uh, mm. professionals. Uh, but still within that, yeah, it's very much that kind of um, a creator-led community engaged kind yeah, of space 100%. i yeah. mean the two biggest things that you're responsible for even using this process that i've used is you're responsible for your own editing and you're responsible for your own marketing so it's up to you up to me to make sure that i actually have a quality book to offer people because they're not going to read through it and go oh you should change this plot point here or you should fix that typo there like that's all for me and my my friends proofreaders to deal with and then once it's published, it's been totally up to me to find ways of actually getting the word out to people and um, telling them that I wrote a book and they might like it. So one of the steps you took was uh, a book launch? Yes. Uh, what were the steps like in terms of event managing a book launch? How, what, were, what were the choices you were making and, and how, how did you find it going? Well, the first thing was choosing a venue, which was... Supr not difficult, but required more thought than you'd expect. Like I initially thought, oh, maybe I'll try and have my book launch at Fuller's, which is our local Tasmanian bookshop because they specialise in book-related events. Um, and I sent them an email and they didn't have any space in their calendar. So I thought, oh, well, I'm going to have to do something else. What could I do? Could I rent a community hall? What could I do? And I thought, oh, well, I like the idea of a more casual sort of intimate book launch because everyone who's going to be there is people that I know personally anyway so I wanted to um, have a relatively informal like cozy feeling event so I thought well what if I just book out a function room at a pub and so then it was a matter of well which pubs have the nicest function rooms um, I ended up choosing Jack Green on a friend's recommendation this friend actually works in event management and I checked out their room and it was just this room full of books on bookshelves and leather armchairs and I thought that's a good vibe so I had to book the room and then I had to think about um, what is my book launch going to consist of because I've actually never been to a book launch before so I thought oh well I'll have to have books available to sell and then I had to think oh how am I going to sell them because uh, initially I thought maybe people pay in cash or whatever but I ended up um, buying a square FPOS reader. Right, yeah, yeah. So, so, the, yeah. so this is a little square FPOS reader you could bring along. It's portable and yep. people can just scan in the cards. Or Yeah, yeah. and that I picked that up from a friend who's a musician and she sells her own merchandise at her gigs. And I realised, oh, well, if she's just up, she's not a business, she's a person. If she can use this little thing, then it can't be that hard um, or expensive. And because you make it then easier for people to physically buy your book, more yeah. people will want to do that because they haven't had to go to the headache of making sure they bring cash and yes. I don't have to make sure I have change. I mean, I did both. Um, How did it go? Yeah. Did most people buy with cash or use card? The vast majority of people used card. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure if I had said in the invitation, oh, only taking cash, then they would have gone to the effort, but it's nice to make it just a bit more streamlined for people. Great. So, okay, so uh, uh, one of the things you had to decide, like, how do you how do you sell your books? Uh, yeah. And that was successful. Um, what else did you need to organise for the itinerary of the book launch? Um, I needed to have in mind, was I going to make some sort of speech or what was I going to do to actually entertain people? I wanted to mostly focus on just interacting and having people mingling because everyone there was sort of friends with each other anyway. So I didn't want it to just be everyone sitting down for two hours and listening to me speak. But I prepared, uh, loosely prepared a few words to just explain a little bit about the book and where the idea came from and what it's about for people who didn't 
know already and then I did a reading of the book just a piece of it so that people could get like a sneak preview of what they were buying I suppose and an idea of what it would sound like and perhaps a sneak preview of an audio book if that ever ends up coming into being um so at an arbitrary point during the night I just got up and yelled for silence and it was a bit awkward because there was live music going on downstairs <laughs> which that was a miscommunication between me and the um the <laughs> the venue hosts but because even though you, you like yeah. everyone upstairs in the event room was silent, but yeah. then downstairs it was party yeah, time. Yeah, bit, a bit more noisy. And that, that was also just the um, result of choosing a Friday night for book launch. That was the other decision I had oh, to right. make. Like, am I going to make people come out on a weeknight or am I going to ask people to give up their Friday night partying for a couple of hours to come and listen to me talk about my book? And there's pros and cons in both. One of the cons was, it turns out, live music live in your music venue. music on a Friday, yeah. But it didn't end up being too big a deal. Like, there just was a natural break eventually and I spoke very loudly and I think people heard what I had to say and I just oh, kept it short right. and sweet yeah I, 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 and then the um uh, as you're talking about the passage of your book well Zeke will have to bring Eileen in again to do a short book reading oh, I'd love in the to future it'd be wonderful to get uh, uh, some flavor of of the book in there we can do voices yeah, 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 we can. I'll write a script. Yeah. I'll adapt it into like a radio drama. Yeah, if you want, feel free to choose a particularly conversational moment, <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, we'll get our, our voice acting skills yeah. out. Um, yeah, we're so, a great voice actor. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Sometimes. Um, so, uh, um, and any other event management aspects to it that you look back on and thought um, that worked well or that didn't work oh. as well? Um, well, one of the unexpected bonuses actually was that I had a couple of friends who are busily launching their photography businesses at the moment. And I didn't reach out to them at all because I just thought, oh, I'll get my sister to take some photos on an iPhone or whatever and I'll put them on Instagram later. But then these friends reached out to me of their own accord and said, would you like us to take photos at the event? And so I got some really high quality oh, wow. photos pro bono, which uh, looked amazing. And I put them up on my Instagram later and that was really cool. I thought about doing like a Facebook live stream post for the speaking part of the event so that friends from interstate could have tuned in if they'd wanted to. I ended up not doing that purely because it got to that point on the night and I realised that to do a Facebook live post from your phone you have to have the Facebook app which I don't <laughs> because I hate having lots of apps. So I got there and I was like oh I physically can't do this. Oh, well, luckily I didn't advertise to all of my interstate friends that I was going to do that. It was just going to be a very low-key um, surprise. It didn't end up happening. Sorry, interstate friends. Hey, look, yeah, yeah. It, it, it sounds like, yeah, of all the things, satisfying a digital on-air component yeah. was was a uh, uh, less important because the face-to-face -face material seemed yeah. to have gone so well. well Congratulations. Like, after, thank you. After, like, two, three years of just so many Zoom events, I was like, people are probably all digital evented out and I wanted the emphasis of the book launch to be on like the interpersonal physical interaction so that wasn't bad but for future reference and if you ever want to do something like that when you're launching your own book it would be something to think about like do you want to have a live stream component and if so make sure you plan that better <laughs> so we've got about a minute or two left um um uh it, it, so the, the where can people go to find out more about the the work you're creating, the book Two Bodies, Three Falls? Where, where, where can we point them to? At the moment, um, best place would be my Instagram page, just at eily.doreen, that's E-I-L-I-D-H dot D-I-R-E-E-N. I'm working on a website that's going to come out hopefully in the next few weeks. Um, so eventually there'll be a website people can use. Um, but other than that, probably word of mouth. And I've got an email list that I'm always adding people to so that they can get emailed announcements of future releases. Great. Well, we're always happy to publicise the work of great local talent uh, such yeah. as yourself, Eile. Uh And I, I guess conflict of interest. I mean, I, I was Eile's lecturer <laughs> years, years ago. I think the statute of... of of conflict there has passed mm, what, just, this is like 10 yeah, years ago i did take you to japan though it's true for the benefit of the listeners the character of roy Devereux phd was not based on craig <laughs> norris <laughs> or you not don't want him to be trust me until the fan fiction comes yeah until out. the yeah, fan yeah, fiction comes yeah, out yeah. yeah i don't want okay yeah well <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I'm so excited, Eileen. This is sounding like such a great, satisfying accomplishment to arrive at. So many people, I think, have great ideas for books, but struggle to translate into reality. So it's such a pleasure to have this moment of uh, of the birth of this great piece of work. Uh, so certainly it's gotten B.A. Zeke and myself quite excited to see how we can contribute to it in our own weird way. Thank you. Uh, I'm excited. But, but certainly it's such a, it's such a great, uh, great thing to, to, uh, to dive into now. As, as uh, summer's coming around, people have time to read books on, I don't know, the beach maybe. Mm. Uh, this is certainly one to read. Uh, and we'll have to get you back in as you're establishing your media empire with the website and you're increasingly growing the uh, spread of this great work. Uh, it would be great to get you back in to talk a little bit more about it. That would be awesome. Thank you. Uh, that's Ailee uh, Doreen? Doreen. Doreen? Yeah, I did a better job on the surname. <laughs> uh, with her book, Two Bodies, Three Fools. We'll post further information up on our Facebook page if people are interested in it as well. This has been Media Mothership for another week. I've been Dr. Craig. And B.A. Zeke has been here too. How are you feeling? That's me. Had a good time. <laughs> <laughs> Zingers as always. Uh, keep listening to Edge Radio. We've got Adrian coming up next with some great mellow, well, possibly not mellow, but certainly cool, nostalgic retro deep dives into. I, I, I know there's some Brit stuff, Brit pop stuff in the past, but who knows where it's going tonight? Yeah, Something nice. cool. Could go everywhere, anywhere. See, you've got the language now, <laughs> B.A. Zeke. All right, uh, you stay, stay good. And uh, two bodies, three falls by uh, Eileen Doreen. <laughs>